Good evening and welcome to the first installment of this year's Rare Music series. Uh, my name is Aaron Wellborn. I'm the library's director of communications, uh, or if it's easier for you to remember, the new Eileen. Uh, we're, we're really glad you're here and the library is, is thrilled to be a co-sponsor of this event, which is now, uh, Brenda was just telling me, in its fifth year. So uh, welcome, thank you for coming. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, before we get started that uh, we wanted to thank our other co-sponsors who helped make this event happen, especially the Duke University Musical Instrument Collections and the Friends of Dumick, uh, also the Vice Provost for the Arts, uh, the Carabina Endowment, High Strung Violins and Guitars, Vocor Incorporated, and uh, Ruggiero Piano. So if you enjoy this series, and I hope you do, uh, please tell our sponsors and tell them how much you appreciate it. We really uh, are thrilled with the success of this program and want it to continue. Um, so I'm also going to hand things over to uh, my friend and colleague Brenda, who's gonna introduce our guest performers this evening. And, uh, but before we get started, if you have a cell phone or electronic <coughs> device, please take a minute right now to go ahead and turn it off or put it on silent mode. All right, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Aaron. We're so happy to have Aaron here. So welcome to Aaron Wellborn. <laughs> I'm so excited that we've made it to season five. We're half a decade strong, and uh, thank you all. I see familiar faces and new faces, and this is very exciting. We have a wonderful series ahead of us, and so have a look at the website, dumic.org. The next performances, we have two in October because we had some scheduling difficulties for November, so that's a little bit different. We have the first one is in October, October the 15th, as usual, four o'clock here. And then a little bit unusual, the next Monday, we're gonna have a Carnatic music program at noon for a lunchtime performance at Dumic in Biddle Music Building. Details are on the website. I just wanted to take a moment to thank Jennifer Morgan for volunteering her time and Jessica Janecki for working late on a Friday and helping us out here. And it's so wonderful to be working with the libraries. So thank you to everyone in the libraries uh, for, for working with Dumic. And at this time, I'm very excited to introduce Richard Ruggiero. I, we met today, actually, but we met on the phone uh, over the summer. And it was Eileen Nelson's idea. She had said, oh, you must get Richard Ruggiero on, on the series. And I called him up and I had such a wonderful program. We were gonna do maybe a partial program. I thought, nope, I would love for him to do a full program. I'm so excited. So he has kindly agreed to come here. Please check out his website, check out, he's got some materials at the back there. If you're interested in pianos, please do check those out on the desk as you leave. And also I want to thank uh, R Professor Randall Love for coming in and helping with the demonstration today. That's very kind of him, thank you so much. And I'm gonna hand this over to Richard because you don't wanna hear me speak, you're here to hear him. So welcome, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, what, a, what a great group. No pressure, huh? Season five on the first one. <laughs> Yay. And we haven't done this class before. We had to tailor make this class for what we thought would be the most interesting for this group. And so I'm gonna leave things a little bit loose in the sense that if there's things you want to talk about, questions you have that You've always wondered about, uh, about piano's tone and function and manufacturing. I will do my best to answer those questions. Now, disclaimer, I'm not a history uh, buff when it comes to pianos. Uh, uh, Rand would probably do a better job of that than I would. Uh, I'm a technician, and I've been a technician for about 32 years. My father was a piano technician and started our business back in 1958. My son is a piano technician, and now he has a, a little one-year-old, so we <laughs> all know. We could have a fourth generation of our Ruggiero piano. Um, the, the business has grown over the years, and now we also offer pianos for sale. And uh, we have many different makes. Most of them are what I would consider handmade, limited production European grand pianos. Uh, pianos like Ludendorff and Pazzioli, Gleitner, Schimmel, 
lot of the piano you saw on the, the video, the Renner video, that used their parts. Nathan and Hammond is another American company that uses those parts. Um, because of that, I've, I've had a lot of experience in dealing with different artists, performers, and piano tone. Uh, it's a very, very personal thing, piano tone. Uh, everybody wants a different kind of sound, a different kind of performance. So it's uh, our job as technicians to listen to those requests and try to tailor that piano to that customer. Um, there are many different makers out there, and every maker has a philosophy of sound. Bluegner, for instance, was a, a piano maker uh, from the 1850s, and Julius Bluegner, the founder, wanted to make a piano that sounded like a human voice. That was his premise for sound. Canavi was another maker that wanted a piano to sound like a human voice. Uh, there are pianos that are bright. There are pianos that are mellow. There are pianos that have a big voice. There are pianos that have a small voice. And all these are pianos that are appropriate for certain settings and certain, and certain customers. Um, there are many parts that go into making the piano. You saw a couple little snippets on the video of, of the three or 4,000 moving parts that go into creating the touch that we have today across the piano keyboard. And this is just a model of a grand piano. And you play the note, the hammer hits the string. Seems pretty simple, doesn't it? But in making each note play evenly, all 88, there's about 27 steps of regulation for each one. So it takes a considerable amount of time to adjust the piano, all different parameters so that it plays evenly. A couple of other components that create a piano sound. Obviously, you have the piano's rim. The rim of a piano's job is to reflect sound. The soundboard vibrates, the rim reflects the sound. The more dense and rigid the, the structure of that, that frame or rim is, the more dynamic range the piano is capable of. Um, this is a rim, just a, a sample of a rim of a Mason and Hamlin piano. And you can see all the laminations of maple that make up this rim that form the shape of the piano. Uh, Here's the, sound, here's the soundboard. On the video, we saw that the soundboard has a curved shape that it's put into a press to make it have some tension. Anybody know why that is? Any guesses out there? More vibration. More vibration? Mm -hmm. Any other guesses why we should have this wood under tension and have a curved shape? The spherical shape, it's about a 60 foot radius. So if you can, if you can picture a 120 foot diameter beach ball, that's about the curves that a piano soundboard has. It can absorb more energy and give back more energy. Yes, another reason. Also, if you have, well, take a venture a guess about how many tons of tension we have on the strings in the piano. We have about 225 strings all pulling. So you have about 20 or 30,000 pounds <coughs> of tension on the piano pulling all the time. And it's also pushing down. So this spherical shape of that soundboard is going to resist that <coughs> constant downward pressure. So it's a good little example of how when a piano gets old and the, and the rim relaxes, the piano's tone dissipates and you, you have a piano that still works, but it's not very exciting to, to play. So a piano's rim under pressure, the tone is focused. This is what we want in a quality piano. Oh my God. If we don't have this one ingredient, then we it doesn't matter what I do to these hammers, you know, we have a, you know, the, the piano has lost its life, so to speak, and it needs to be recalibrated. It needs a new soundboard. And only a few piano makers are worthy of that, that level of work to restore the instrument to, to that tonal performance. Can we see one more time? Yeah. <laughs> so the idea with these two outer pieces being the rim of the piano, we want that rim to stay in a constant shape, you know, for the life of the piano. The really good pianos put a lot of effort and to making sure that that, that shape is maintained. Um, Mason and Hamill actually has a turnbuckle system underneath it, a big metal hub that locks the rim from spreading over time. You can, if you're interested, you can take a look under there <laughs> after the class. Um, here's another little example. This is a nice little visual aid here. If you can picture this as the crown of the soundboard, which is about what you have in the piano, and this end, the end pieces being the, the outer rim. I just have this little business card in there. If that rim settles just that much over time, 
you, you know, you have, you have the ability to lose that crown. So pianos that are made with soft wood rims or thin rims and don't cost very much, well, there's a reason they don't cost very much. <laughs> uh, they're not going to last very long. That sound's not going to hold up for a long period of time. And pianos that are made with quality have wood that's aged properly. Some makers actually only air drive. This in North River is one company that it takes about four to five years to dry the lumber and to cure it in a succession of drying rooms before it's ready for cutting and, and installation in the piano. So we have the rim, we have the soundboard. Tin box is also an important part of the piano, although it really doesn't affect the sound per se, but this is a, just a jig, and you're welcome to come up and look at it after the class. But it does show what quality lumber looks like, and you have quarter sawn maple that makes up this tin block. And why that's important, and why it's important to have different grain directions is so as the weather changes, and we have a lot of that in North Carolina, that goes from 80% down to 20%, you want a piece of wood that's, that's going to, you know, not going to be too volatile. You want to do, maintain its proper shape and diameter of poles for the pins to remain good and tight. That's another component. That's all the jigs that I've got. Now, the other thing that's really important is the piano has bridges. You remember on the video, there's a bridge that's glued to the soundboard. And that's what the strings go across. Just like a violin or a cello has a bridge, a piano has a bridge. And it's important for the, the, sh the string to be at its highest point as it goes over the bridge so that the sound can get through the bridge to the soundboard. However, it, ha it can't be too, uh, it, there can't be too much stress on that string. It can't be too high. Or the, the force will choke the soundboard and prevent it from vibrating. So really quality piano makers will, by hand, take a string across that bridge and plane it down ever so gradually until they get the perfect height, the perfect load on that soundboard. That way the board is receiving the vibration from the string, but it's not being overly compressed. And, and so the piano that you play, you play a note up high and it dissipates really, really fast, uh, but it has a lot of punch, there's too much bearing, there's too much deflection on that string. And that'll cause problems later, and, and it, the sound can't be as beautiful. Likewise, really old <coughs> pianos, you'll get a lot of sustain, but not very much dynamic because the soundboard has lost its crown. There's very little deflection on its string. So it can sing a long time, but there's, there's no sort of dynamic range. So somewhere in between, there's a happy medium. That's what all piano makers try and do. And the hand makers really have a, a sort of a, um, an artisan approach. They feel the flex on the soundboard and they know from instinct and from experience how much to plane that bridge down. When we rebuild a piano, we do a lot of restoration at our shop. Sometimes we'll plane those bridges if they're too high to create a better sound. So there's, there, there's a lot of, the point of all this is there, there's a lot of factors that go into making a piano's hum. And even after all those things are done properly, we have a lot of things we can do as technicians in the field to customize a piano for a particular client. And when you're working with the university setting, becomes a little more difficult because you have a lot of different taste buds for sound. <laughs> you have a lot of performers. One wants it bright, one wants it mellow. One, so sometimes it's a trick to make it sort of come up with a happy medium of, of sound that everyone enjoys. When you're working with a private client, you know, creating the right sound is, it comes about by listening to what they like. Maybe listening to a recording that they particularly like. Then doing your best to make their piano in their home sound like that recording, or sound like the information that they, that they gave to you. And I may not like the sound when I'm done, but they're the ones that own the piano, play it every day, and so you have to listen to what the customer wants in order to achieve the right sound. <coughs> okay. The final thing that can really change the, the sound of a piano are the hammers. And provided all the um, construction of the piano has been done properly. And that you've regulated your action because the regulation of an action or the adjustment of the, the 3,000 parts of the piano will affect the sound. How hard the hammer hits the string is going to affect the tone of that note. Um, so this action has to be regulated. Also, the hammer on most of the notes hits three strings at once. I don't know if you knew that, but for every note there's three strings. They all have to be tuned identically. And the hammer has to hit all three evenly. You can't hit one and the other two. It has to hit all three exactly at the same time, which means the hammer has to both be glued on properly, and it has to travel precisely 90 degrees up to the string. 
These are all things that we adjust in the field as technicians, making sure every shank is coming up perpendicular to the string, and that every hammer is parallel to the string as it comes up. So once that's all done, I did one uh, at another neighboring university just finished it this morning. The first 12 hours was all this stuff, and the last 50 minutes <laughs> was the voicing uh, of the piano. So voicing is kind of like the icing on the cake. If you've done everything else well, there's not as much voicing to do. Okay, so now we have some different hammers, and we're just going to talk a little bit. And feel free, please, to stop me with any questions. I am happy to answer any questions that you might have. So there's different philosophies of hammer making, just like there's different philosophies of um, you know making a piano. Different uh, philosophies of what kind of wood goes in the soundboard, how the bridges are located, uh, where the hammer strikes the string are all uh, components of making a piano's tone. But the hammer also is a component. And so you have cold pressed hammers. And these are hammers that are put into the press and they, they don't receive any heat. They're just allowed to sort of dry naturally. And those hammers many times are too soft in that uh, initial manufacturing state to create any dynamic range and you have to harden them. And you harden them with a couple of, we call, them, we call it hammer juice, but uh, th this is actually a, a chemical with some plastic substance melted in it that would densify and stiffen this felt. Uh, you're gonna hear how stiff I made these hammers in just a little while when we have replaced. I sort of went overboard uh, to demonstrate the point that you can take a hammer that's really bright and then we're going to take the very same piano after we place uh, some excerpts and we're going to voice it down. I'm gonna show you how to voice the, the piano down so we'll smell it. And then he'll play it again, you can hear the difference. How is your key juice different from lacquer? What's lacquer? Well, lacquer is a, does the very same thing. Lacquer is used in the right proportion, the right section of the piano will cause the felt to become stiffer and harder. And thereby when it hits the string, it doesn't recoil as much. It, it, it acts more like a wooden mallet than a really soft felt mallet. So you have more of an accent in the sound. But uh, lacquer is the, the, uh, the uh, substance of choice if you're in the shop, if you're working, you have plenty of time for it to dry because it takes a good amount of time for it to dry. If you're in the field uh, and, and you're on the go, then you use this because it's 30 minutes, it's, it sets. Yes? Um, if one doesn't use the lacquer, will the, um, will the hammer just harden just by playing over a long period of time? That's an excellent question. Um, Very good question. Um, eventually, if you play a piano long enough, the, the, the piano will brighten up some, but if the shoulders did never receive the proper amount of lacquer at the factory, I don't, it's my belief that you'll never fully achieve the dynamic range of that instrument because the hammer's recoiling too much. So our goal, if we're working on a concert piano, is to maximize dynamic range with minimum amount of noise. Because the more lacquer or more stiffening agent you add to the felt, the more percussive noise there is. So the trick is, Lots of dynamic range to project the piano out into the audience, but not too much from, you know, the, of that clappy sounding noise, which you're going to hear in just a minute. <laughs> That's a very bright piano right now. Um, but it makes the point. Uh, Steinway hammers, for instance, are very soft, and so you have to lacquer them. It's a philosophy of tone. It works well if you know how to do that. Um, I, I've, done, I've done some training up at Steinway and gone through that process and, and know how to, to make Finally, hammers have a big dynamic range. It's not complicated. Uh, other you know, makers like Renner use a tension felt. They're not hot pressed like mass-produced pianos, but they're just wrapped around the wooden core with lots of tension. So you don't have to add, theoretically, you don't have to add any stiffening agent to the felt to create a, a big dynamic range for that piano. Two velocities, soft felt, they build up the sound, a tension felt like this, comes out of the box, ready to put in the piano and enjoy. Uh, and you usually have to voice these down. They're usually too bright and you have to bring down the sound. And we do that with needles, just like you saw in the video. We use needles to, to stab the felt uh, and loosen up the fibers so that it flexes a little more. When it hits the string, it stays on a little bit longer. It's a little softer. It makes a more pleasing sound. Uh, then there's hot press hammers, really high production piano makers use hammers that they put in presses, they're hot, to glue, dry the glue quickly, and they come out, and they slice them, and they, they're really hard. And the more you play them, 
the, the harder they get, and it's a constant battle all the time dealing with these. A lot of, um, of like the Japanese, I'm uh, using names, but Japanese piano makers will have customers come to us and we'll recustomize their exactions with German hammers. So we'll take out those really hard bricks and we'll put in you know, a, hammer, a tension hammer, like a Renner hammer or an Auto hammer, to create a more pleasing dynamic range and more pleasing sound. And it makes a huge difference. You can really transform a piano's tone based on the kind of hammer. And when we're rebuilding a piano, whether it's a 20 Steinway or Mason and Hamlin, we'll talk to, a lot to the customer about what they want, what kind of sound do you want in the piano's, you know, in the final product. That helps us determine what we're going to put install in the piano. Stand. I'm gonna just take some of these hammers while we're talking here. If you like, I can pass these around. If you're interested in just, and I'm not gonna tell you who makes the hammer, you can just sort of feel. These are all remaining parts that we've had left over from cows we've, we've built over the years. And so I'll just, I'll start these around and you can just, just pass them back and you want to hang on to one, you can. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Any questions so far? Yes. About the hammers. They obviously take a beating. How long do they last? <laughs> How often do they need to be replaced? And isn't it a terrible job? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're, I mean, it depends on two things, uh, or well, actually three or four things, but the primary thing would be the intensity and frequency of play. I mean, if you have a practice room piano in the university and it becomes the, the therapeutic classroom for students <laughs> <laughs> to get out their frustrations on a daily basis, then you, you may be replacing, should replace those hammers every five, six years. So you, you, you can just, they can really get beat up fast. Um, if you have, you know, someone who plays on Sunday afternoon for an hour and a half and they play, you know, little show tunes or something like that, you may never have to replace it. It may, it may last the entire life of the piano. Um, and then you also have the factor of level of performance. Hammers can work and make a sound, but maybe not make a good enough sound for the concert stage. So in a setting where you have um, high level performances like Duke does over at Reynolds, um, really the hammer should be replaced, you know, seven to 10 years, you should be putting a new set of hammers in, replacing those hammers and, you know, making them, th them really sound, you know, as refined as possible. There's exceptions to that. If the piano gets tucked away in its, in its lockbox most of the time and get played much, you can go longer than that. If it gets a steady diet of <coughs> performance, then there's gonna come a point, you know, that they'll need to be replaced. Um, also strings, you know, strings oxidize, they, they stiffen, they get dull sounding, and I, I would say every 10 to 15 years, you know, a good piano in a concert setting really should have a new set of strings. You really want it to sound, now it, it can sound fine for the, for the average year for a lot longer than that, but for really top notch, you know, critical performance, I would say about that often, have that work done. Any other questions? Yes? You talked a lot about the tone of a piano. What about the touch of the piano? Uh, How hard or soft the keys are? I was wondering when that question was going to come up. <laughs> and I, I've heard it said that there's some mathematical formula someone at MIT or maybe Yale <laughs> developed that actually lets the technician adjust the uh, feel of, the, of how hard the keys are. Well, it's an interesting so topic. anything you want. Is that true? Is it that easy? Um, yes and no. Yes, if you have a magnetic balanced action installed to your piano, it's that easy. Um, it's been maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago, a couple of European technicians have developed a system of magnetic balancing the keys. They didn't have, keys didn't have weights in them. Keys have weights to give you the right leverage, the right touch. They took the weights out and they put magnets in, opposing and attracting magnets on either side of the key, which is basically a seesaw. Um, and you could adjust those weights up and down, or those magnets up and down to give you a certain resistance. On the front of the piano, there's four holes through this key slit. I'll probably go ahead and take off because we're ready to pull the action now. And you could reach through those holes and turn a screw and it would change the position of these rails of magnets. And you could go from, say, 45 grams of down weight, which is kind of light for a piano, up to 65, which is really kind of heavy. And you could do it in a matter of 
45 seconds. <laughs> um, yes, technicians can change the touch weight of a piano. You either have to re remove, let me show you the, the choices. You either have to remove mass somewhere, take this hammer tail and sand it down so there's less weight. And basically for every gram of weight I take off this hammer, it's going uh, it's a five to one ratio. So if I can get, or four to five gram, if I can get a gram of weight off of this, I can reduce the touch weight in front by about four, which is a lot. Even getting a half gram off to reduce the touch weight by two or three gram is significant if the piano is just a little too heavy. You can also add weights to the keys, more weights to the keys, so that it's easier to, to press them down. The danger in adding more weight to the keys is the lever becomes heavy. And if the lever becomes too heavy, then it, you have another problem. It's, not, it's still not enjoyable to play. It has to do with the engineering. Pianos that are engineered well, with really good geometry, you don't have those problems. Tour pianos with bad engineering, and sometimes you can't fix them. The, the parameters are too narrow to fix the, the problem. Uh, also, the subject of touch. While we're talking, I'm going to plug this in. Please beware, this is a soldering iron. And after the class, please use care. I'm going to do a little demonstration of steam voicing, which is a very interesting. subject of touch and how it's linked to um, tone is very, very interesting. Um, a piano that projects sound very easily, it's really bright, tends to feel lighter because you're not having to you know, exert as much force to get the sound out of the piano. Sometimes if we voice the piano down, which means make, means make it mellower, the pianist says, well, it sounds better, but you made it heavier. Well, no, we didn't make it heavier. It's just taking more effort to get the sound out of the piano. So touch and tone um, are really linked, uh, and you have to pay attention to both when you're changing one or the other. Let this heat up. Okay, let's take the uh, moment. I think this will be good timing for our time looks like. It'll be really good timing for uh, Natty Love to come up. And what we're going to do is we're going to He's going to play a couple of excerpts on uh, different styles of music and intensities to show you how class-breakingly bright <laughs> this piano is. It's really, I really went overboard. So <laughs> I apologize to your ears in advance. <laughs> so I'll play a, a, a <laughs> lyric passage from uh, Chopin's third ballade in A flat and, and a brilliant passage from the same piece to uh, get a, a sense of the sound. And, then uh, at the end, I'll play the entire piece on the much improved. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
or not. And if you like the way that sounds, don't think anything of it. I have customers that would love the way that piano sounds. They play jazz, they play ragtime, they play some music that the, a bright piano is appropriate for. And I swear them in secrecy, but I make the piano that bright for them. Um, and they love it. I personally don't care for that. So, um, yes? Uh, making it something that Randy said, uh, do you sometimes voice a piano differently across the range of strings with more brightness in the bass and less at the left? Or do you try to make it consistent all the way through? That's a good question. It's, it's a difficult thing sometimes because certain ranges of your piano do sound more exciting when there are certain timbers, but not others. So really what most manufacturers and what most technicians strive for is a balance scale, what we call a balance scale, that no matter where you play and no matter what intensity, you get a similar accent. So it's predictable. You're not having to compensate for the piano because what else bad happens? You have the piano, it's not even, the piano starts compensating and that's not good for the for practice. So unless I have a special request, I've had concert tunes where they said make the D really bright because there's this <laughs> one part in the piece that I need to really hit it and it really needs to be bright and I'll do that. <laughs> but I have some strange requests like that sometimes. And I'm going to pull the action out of the piano and we're going to attempt, because I think I went a little overboard with my hammer juice. <laughs> we're going to attempt to bring the sound way down quickly. Um, and sometimes I might have to do this in a concert setting in an emergency. So this would be called emergency voicing. You get to the piano and it's just not suitable for performance. As you have an hour and 20 minutes and you've got to make the time count make the biggest tank difference you can. Yes, up here. Is. Uh, I thought what might be interesting to do first is take the octave from middle C to the C right above and just voice that one octave every other note so we can hear maybe what the difference would be as we go through. Are you kneeling the shoulders, or are you doing the strike point? It's a secret. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Randy asked a very good question, and um, we do have a few secrets in the business. Um, the further down you needle, what range of sound do you think that that would affect more? Here's the shoulder of the hammer. I'm going to needle it. If you're playing pianissimo, and the note's too bright, what part of the hammer might you want to voice, do you think? Hmm? The top, yeah. yeah. The harder you play, the more the hammer recoils. So if you're playing, it's sweet sounding when you play through this but it's bright when you play really loud. You know that the problem's not here, it's down here. This piano's bright all the time, <laughs> no, matter, no matter what you do. So I'm gonna do it, give it a wholesale needling. This is not what I would necessarily do as, as a practice. Uh, I wouldn't make this hard to start with. But for the purpose of the class, this might make the most dramatic sort of effect. So what I'm doing here, uh, don't try this at home. <laughs> don't tell your technician. Uh, but I am going to do some deep shoulder needling and also some surface needling. So I'm going to do every other hammer. I definitely need to read space. pretty aggressive because I had, I had a big formula, a, a pretty concentrated formula of, um, of my hammer juice. Seems kind of extreme, doesn't it? <laughs> Usually we'll try one of these and see what it sounds like first. I do them all, but I think I'm safe. Okay. So we've got C, D, F sharp going up that way.
you going to do the entire range of the piano? Are you, are you going to yeah. do all of them? I'm going to do all of them. Okay. Maybe that's a good time people might want to come up and look. At most I think the, they're welcome to come up and look. Just be careful with this. And I may end up <coughs> using this. Another technique we use to make the hammers sound different is steam voicing. Steam voicing opens up, kind of opens up the uh, the felt, and we can try the the C sharp. Just going to take this. This, this is an old, old technique that's been around for years. Very, very quickly through a C sharp. Let's listen to C sharp now. Now, in, in true practice, we would give this a, a day to recover and then go back and check it. Substance that you felt mm -hmm. than the common felt. I mean, is there any other thing that you find in a piano? Not a not a modern day piano. You know, the forte pianos from the 1800s and before. A lot of them had leather hammers, uh -huh. and they were very light, and you had string tensions that were very low, and the action wasn't as powerful. So it was very light. It was very quick. So back then, this was a much smaller hammer, and a lot of times they were leather covered. Do you, do you feel like there's like there's room for maybe Changing what what it's made of to make you make your double easier. Um, <laughs> uh, well, perhaps change, easy, easily change the tone. I think people are always looking for better ways. You know, there's companies that are experimenting right now with carbon fiber soundboards. Schimmel, Steingraber, several German companies that make pianos that have carbon fiber soundboards. And um, so they're they're always all, always looking for an edge, something that's going to give better performance. But the good thing about the felt hammers is. They're easy to change the sound on. You know, you can you have a variety of tone um, that, they can, that they're capable of. And under normal play, they last a long time. So I'm sure there's always research going on in the various companies trying to find something else. And this is going to affect your tone. Hmm. Does it change the touch of what you're doing right now? Does not change the touch. Only to make it feel persistent. You perceive a little bit harder touch because you're having to play harder to get the same amount of volume. Yeah. So changing the touch has to do with the leverage of the keys. And that has to be done very carefully by adding or, or removing weights. I'm just trying to get through these as quick as I can. Did you do something to make them bright before oh, yeah. class? <laughs> I put about three gallons of that hammer juice on them. Because <laughs> I wanted the, the most extreme effects that we could get. It worked. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was, I would consider that sound offensive, actually. <laughs> I, I know there was a big push a while back with a lot of popularity with the original instruments, uh, recordings and presentations. When, with a lot of those older instruments, did a lot of the hammers and other inners have to be replaced, and to what perceivable effect would that have had? Yeah, any piano that we would build gets a complete new action, all new parts, because the old parts lose their, their stiffness for one. Mm -hmm. Stiffness is important for parts for a piano, because when the hammer hits a string, it's quite a violent act. Right. You can slow it down and watch it from the front. 
it would be doing this and over, I mean, moving all around. And so the parts have to, and the shanks have to be very stiff. The teeth have to be stiff so they don't flex when you play hard. As the piano gets older, the wood gets more flexible. It doesn't perform up to the level that we need. So anytime we rebuild a quality piano, like a 20 Steinway or Mason Hamlin or Bosley Warper, we always put a complete new set of parts in. And that actually elevates the, the value of the piano. It doesn't decrease it. It elevates it. Because piano is valued based on performance. Unless it belongs to a president or famous composer or something like that. With historic pianos, it's a little different. You're trying to preserve what's there because there's not many of them left. So it's a whole different philosophy when you're working with a rare music collection than when you're working with a modern piano. And a modern piano would be anything from 1880 up till now, you know, pretty much. So what's the highest note in your piece, Randy? <laughs> it's, uh, uh, I think it's, a, I think it's the uh, F. Instead of the C. I mean, it goes up to it, 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 the highest note is the. Just to set a time. We don't go. We don't go. <coughs> okay. Okay. Almost there. Yeah. Good little time that way. Not quite hot enough. Well, I see that the scene is much, much less faster. Um, but are you as satisfied with the result? In the in the right circumstances, I am. You know, you can only use it in extreme conditions. And we have, this is what we have here, um, <laughs> for sure. I am satisfied with the results when the hammers are really hard. And it kind of reduces some of what was already done. The su yeah. substance that went in kind of helps remove some of that. Does the belt deteriorate when you do the scratch? Well, you have, to, you have to be, use moderation. You, know, you can't leave it, leave it on there too long. But it really doesn't. It doesn't affect the long-term performance. Can I give you a question? Yes. Are the moving parts standardized like automobile parts? The um, hammer and the keys, that sort of thing. Their overall design and function are pretty much the same on every piano, with a few obscure exceptions. But the German philosophy of touch is what we've been, what we've adopted, and the French had a different way of doing things. But the German action is what we ended up with, and that's pretty much the way all pianos look inside. They all look almost identical. The difference is the engineering, the quality of the parts, and the installation is so critical. That creates the, the, the better piano. So, but they all look, look almost identical, which makes shopping really interesting. Because they all look the same on the outside, but they don't all perform the same. Um, can I ask a question about yeah. the wood? Mm -hmm. what Only if the climate was different, if the humidity was a lot different. Like if you take, for instance, the pianos that go to Aspen, to the Aspen Music Festival, a lot of times, a lot of times those hammers have to be rehammered. Those pianos have to be rehammered afterwards because the hammers get so dry. It definitely changes the sound. How about the wood? Um, it depends on the vintage of the piano. Certain pianos were dried down to the proper moisture content for our seasons, and so if you have a piano like that, it should be fine here. If the wood was dried down to five five and a half percent moisture content for construction, then it should be fine over here in our climate. But so if it wasn't, you could have problems. Early pianos from Bechstein and Blitzer from the 1900s really had problems when they came over. The case would expand and it would be a big change. More modern pianos don't have that problem. But do you think it's best if you made a piano with like the wood from that climate? Well, most all makers now have a universal drying scheme or curing scheme for their lumber, so it works anywhere, anywhere in the world. It would be safe. Yeah, do those twice. Don't really know it. Well, I think Randy liked the bass on this piano. You liked the brighter bass, didn't you? Well, it gave it, it gave a, a, a nice uh, projecting sound. Yeah. Mm -hmm. pianos and, and climates and homes is to, to keep them in a relatively even state as much as you can. Somewhere between 35 and 55 percent humidity is fairly safe. 
Anything below 20, you're, just, you're gonna have trouble. Anything above 65 or 70, you could have issues. Can I ask him on that point, there's something called a damp chaser that you can get mm -hmm. for a piano or that you alternate for, for too much humidity and not enough. Right. Is that a good thing to install on a piano? We've, we've found success with those, but they're not, they're not necessary in every case. You know, some people's homes are even enough without them. But especially in institutions where the, the humidity goes up and down a lot, we've had great success with the systems provided you install a whole dehumidification and humidification system. They make a, a full system that does both. If you install that system, that we've found very good results. That's enough torture <laughs> to have it. This is what it sounds like. Getting my time with mine. We're doing okay. The act of wasting a piano, this action, the piano I worked on this morning, the action came in and out about 150 times. So if you listen, you do something, you put it back in, you listen, you take it out. <laughs> Questions about pianos in general? Well, if the parts are standardized, could you take another piece <coughs> like that from another manufacturer and put it into that piano? No, the part, the, the way the piano works is, is fairly standard, but all the dimensions are different. Uh -huh. And that's what makes one piano sound different from the next. Do you have a favorite piano, or does it vary according to how it's going to be used? Yeah, I mean, my, my opinion about pianos and which the, like, people always want to know what's the best piano, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of best pianos, right. you know? Mm -hmm. There's, if you look at the ratings online at pianobuyer.com, I think it's pretty accurate. They have up there in the ratings, uh, Humberg, Steinway, Fuxioli, Gleitner, Dosendorfer, Steingraber. You know, the really fine German pianos. And I kind of agree with that. I think they're the, best, they're the best. But each one has a quality that would be make it the best piano for a person. And that person has to decide is that the right piano for them long term. And that's what we do in terms of selection. We try to help people find the right match. Richard, you mentioned that we ended up with the German uh, approach to making a piano versus the French. What was different in the French? Well, the action of the piano, the French action was much, much lighter. The way the, the, way the, um, the skatement worked was different. The German action was a heavier action, but it was more reliable, more heavy duty. And so we ended up, uh, in a nutshell, going with that. And all the pianos today today are pretty much made with that style of action. But some of the older action models, old, older actions, look, they play really well. The older, lighter designs. What is considered the, the origin of the piano? In which region or city? Or Italy was the claims the inventor. Uh, Cristofori was the, the inventor. But then they didn't do anything after that. Italy kind of petered out after that. Really, the Germans have done the most with modern piano making. I mean, softer, a softer environment with carpet on the floor and you know, a lot of drapes around like this has is going to provide a, a more forgiving environment. If this thing was on marble right now, we'd all be running for our cars. <laughs> 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 Not having 
know, I can make enough of a difference here so that when Randy plays again, we'll have a good result. They're really hard. My, my son chastised me when I was doing this. He said, you're making those way too hard. <coughs> I'm afraid you're right. This is the last chance. I can't take any more time. All right. All right. Say a prayer for me. Okay. <laughs> That's what it sounds like now. <laughs> Can you put that on too? <laughs> <laughs> it's a visual. 
and really felt feel that I could project mm -hmm. to the back row. Yeah, it needs another dose. Yeah, it needs another go through the the steam and yeah. the needles. But it definitely was a difference. Definitely, yeah. 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 Yes. Thank, you, thank you so much for seeing us. Yes. That was terrific. Yes. To my ear, the top octave that he played was far brighter than the rest of the piano. And mm -hmm. I noticed when you were touching them up, you didn't do as much there. Out of time. You, <laughs> it was just a time thing. It was just a time thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wish we could have been a little bit more dramatic difference, but I think we heard what can be done, even in a short period of time, yeah. mm -hmm. to make a piano sound a little different. Mm -hmm. um, the process at this point would be to work with a musician and keep bringing it down until you're happy with the timbre. I would bring it down another 30% or so, and mm -hmm. then I would be happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would too, yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. I'd go with that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the sound would be a little bit more in keeping with this particular maker, which is not supposed to be too bright. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? With the top down, hmm. does it, what kind of difference does it make? That would make, have made some difference. Uh, when you raise the lid on the piano, you get a lot more of the higher harmonics, mm -hmm. especially a piano like this that has what we call duplex scaling which allows the back portion, portion of the string to vibrate in sympathy with the front portion. Um, so that would have made some difference. It's a good, it's a good uh, point, a good question. See me after class. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we're at the point now we need to. Well, I think it's time to let uh, Richard have a glass of wine. And, yes. And yes. Thank you so very uh, much. For you're very welcome. Thank you. I encourage everybody, if you have more questions, please let. I'll be happy Richard. to answer them. I'll hang around near the, the red line and. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it.